Our next speaker is Coleman Watts. He is the host of Think This Through, and it is a fast-growing YouTube show that debunks cons, cults, and conspiracies with a humorous flair. He has been speaking in front of audience since the age of 10, um, and he has performed on stage, taught classes, given presentations, and of course, performed on YouTube. So hopefully we are going to get a lovely little presentation here because he's had, what, 40 years, 30 years of practice? 50, 50. 50. Everybody give it up for Coleman Wise! <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> How are we doing? Ready for lunch? Yeah. I am the only thing standing between you and your lunch so far, <laughs> so we'll see how long this takes. Um, so I am Coleman Watts, and I am the host of the Think This Through channel. Here's my clicker. Thanks, Kenny. I'm here to talk to you about how to challenge your beliefs without looking like an idiot, which I am perfect at. So here's the thing, though. I've never actually spoken before to a group of scientific skeptics. So um, just to you know, put me at ease, if we could just do a quick show of hands. Who here in the audience has ever taken any college level science class? Any science class, AP class in high school, any college? OK, great. That's everybody but me. Um, so great. That helps with my imposter syndrome. All right, so um, you know, whatever. I mean, the title of this presentation could be something else. Um, what it, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep working on it um, throughout the presentation. That's not foreshadowing. It'll just be a work in progress. Anyway. Um, it is great to be here in North Carolina. I actually went to Guilford College in Greensboro. Um, those of you from Greensboro, hello. Um, one of you, thank you. Thank you, awesome. <laughs> and in fact, there is a really embarrassing story I could tell you about that, which for some reason I put in my presentation. <laughs> so, um, all right, here's, here's the thing. I've never actually told this story to anyone, anyone. So if, seriously, for real, this is the first time. That, so yeah, so if, if you could just keep this between you and me, and those of you watching on YouTube, just between us, thank you. So I was 17, and I came to Guilford College for my admittance interview. And I was assigned Dave Dobson, who was the head of one of the science departments and also the author of Snood, but that's not important. And he asked me what I was most interested in studying. And I told him, that I thought the most important scientific discovery of our time would be making contact with the extraterrestrials that were trying to reach us and just think if we put all of our scientific knowledge to the, to the task of the great things that we could learn from an advanced alien civilization. <laughs> he looked at me with a straight face and very earnestly said, okie dokie, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and that was the end of the interview. So. <laughs> I guess that went well because I went to Guilford College and I was accepted. I did not get to study science with Dave Dobson. I actually ended up in the theater department, um, which is where I spent my time and majored in theater. And I learned all kinds of useful things, you know, performance skills and video production skills and useful things that I did not use at all in my career as a software engineer. But uh, what wasn't actually a big part of the curriculum was science or logic or critical thinking. And just a side note here, just an observation. It does seem like a lot of people who study science don't also study communications. And people who study communications and television and performance don't study science. And I don't know if that has anything to do with the way the world is today. Just a thought. Um, but look, all of this is not to say that I'm completely scientifically illiterate. I'm not. I mean, I've watched Star Trek, and I can, <laughs> I can pretend just as well as anybody else to know what a flux capacitor is. Um, and being a science fiction fan, of course, I know to keep my towel with me in case the Earth is blown up to make way for a hyperspace bypass just before the mice can derive the question to the great answer, life, the universe, and everything, the answer being, say it with me now, 42, <laughs> yes, which prompted a species more intelligent than ourselves to escape to an alternate dimension, but not before delivering their final message. That was all from memory, reading the books as a kid, so don't correct me. Okay. So I wasn't science illiterate, um, and I also don't think that I was a conspiracy theorist. I was just a pretty normal 20-something-year-old who maybe watched a little too much X-Files, but nothing major. Um, but trying to look back on it now and think about my process, I think my brain was just, that's my brain, was just sort of doing what normal brains do, which is just collect any information that comes along 
And I wasn't really categorizing it according to scientific validity. It was just sort of hanging on to whatever seemed interesting or useful. So you know, I had these brain pockets. That's a term you can look it up. Brain pockets for science and also another brain pocket for pseudoscience. And it seemed like both you know, medicine and homeopathy could be plausible or useful. You never know when you might need a doctor or a chiropractor. Um, and wow, critical thinking. Also wow, magical thinking. <laughs> and you know, it's cool to learn about astronomy, but also astrology can come in handy. And uh, you know, it's nice to learn about archaeology, but don't discount ancient aliens. That's a valid hypothesis. You know, you can learn about psychology. You can also learn a lot from psychics. They have a lot to offer you. You know, you learn about the laws of nature, but don't discount the supernatural. This stuff can be, you know, who knows, right? Who knows? So meanwhile, I was just basically busy living my life. I had kids to raise. I had a house to take care of. I had a, I had a full-time job. I was developing software that ended up uh, becoming the fundraising software for the Wikimedia Foundation. And so that kept me pretty busy. But that mismatch of information that was all sort of swimming around my brain, it did impact my life in small ways and big ways, from like, you know, spending an extra dollar on fluoride-free toothpaste to big ways like not being sure if I should vaccinate my kids. They're fine, by the way. It all worked out. And you know, things in the middle, like spending extra money on organic food, or going to see the chiropractor every once in a while, or you know, stocking a few homeopathic remedies in case they, I might need them. But then, then something happened to tip those scales. Yes, suddenly I saw the light of reason and became a scientific skeptic. The end, that's all of my presentation. That's it, thank you everybody. I'm just kidding. Um, because what actually happened is social media. You might remember that in the 2010s, social media was developing a little bit of a misinformation problem. Fortunately, the big tech companies that ran social media had a solution to this problem, which I'd like to run through with you right now just to illustrate how effective it was. So first of all, they created a system that incentivizes quantity over quality of information. That's very important. You want to pump out as much content as possible. It takes too much time to fact check things. Next, they invented a cult-like structure where you have a parasocial relationship between social media leaders and followers with a sort of a pyramid structure to it. It's nice. Next, they designed this algorithm that tells people exactly what they want to hear. That's helpful. Why would you want to hear stuff that you don't want to hear? <laughs> then they would train that algorithm to show people more extreme versions of the content that they previously watched. Also helpful. Now, here comes the brilliant part of the plan. Their next step was to ignore the problem for a decade or so. What could possibly go wrong? Next, even smarter part of the plan was to suddenly realize there's a problem. And finally, this is where the solution comes into play. They created a half-assed sort of form of censorship, which ended up poking the hornet's nest that they ended up creating and validating all the conspiracy theorists to narratives of persecution. I don't see anything that could go wrong with this. Uh, Kenny, I'm going to use your laser pointer here. Let's see if this works. Uh, oh, God. Uh, Jesus. Uh, I've, I've prepared a short uh, uh, video uh, presentation for just just watch the watch the educational film. Ecads, I have just discovered that Bigfoot is real. Furthermore, the actual Noah's Ark has been uncovered. Moreover, the pyramids of Egypt were in fact constructed by ancient aliens. I have researched all of these topics on a marvelous piece of technology known as the YouTube. And look at this, a sidebar with recommended videos. The clockwork inside this tube must know that I am a truth seeker because now it says I should watch this expose about lizard people who have taken over the government. Gadzooks, if it wasn't published on this tube of knowledge, I would not believe it. So that is the opening to my, the second video that I did on my channel called The Bullshit Detective. Um, and that video is a sort of a fun romp through the history of fake photography all the way from the Cottingly fairies that fooled Sir Arthur Conan Doyle all the way through to modern uh, UFO photography. And um, like all of my videos, it also mixes in a little bit of my own personal experience in this case of being sucked down the YouTube rabbit hole. And that actually ended up being the subject of the very first video that I did for my channel. And 
In this video, I talk about the metaphors and stories that suck people in and how they get weaponized on YouTube. Uh, metaphors like going down a rabbit hole or look through the looking glass or the matrix or the red pills and blue pills. And it ended up being a really fun video. To, and if you haven't seen it, it's a wild ride. You take the blue pill. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. Whoa, I believe I fell into a chocolate coma. Anyway, so. I want to talk a little bit about what that experience was like for me personally, and this is the first time that I've talked about this. So around 2015-ish, mid-2010s, all of the sort of weird beliefs that I had floating around in my brain pockets um, were sort of being amplified more and more and pushed in my face by the social media feed. Um, and so if you did a search for his fluoride safe, you'd get a video about, you know, Kim Trails turning the frogs gay. Um, or if you were concerned about climate change, you could get a video saying that uh, global warming is definitely a hoax. And the stuff got a lot worse than that. I don't even want to show more. And even if I didn't completely believe what I was being shown, um, the fact that I watched it triggered the algorithm to show me even more extreme content and amp up the volume even more, um, with the compound effect being to push me farther away from reality. So to be clear, these videos were being actively recommended to me by YouTube, which is owned by Google, whose mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And that is definitely not what they were doing. What I think they were doing is pushing people into caves of misinformation. Um, and promoting, let's be honest, some of this stuff was just thinly veiled bigotry. And so on a completely serious note, for people in minority groups that do get targeted, none of this is a joke. There's nothing funny about misinformation that promotes hatred of any gender or class or race of people ever. And I also believe that the conspiracy grifters who are peddling this misinformation do deserve to be ridiculed. Mm -hmm. And that is where I come in. <laughs> so I'd like to show you the very first scene of my very first video, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to play that video. Uh, instead, I'm going to be the video I wish to see in the world. What if I told you that everything you think you know is a big, fat lie. This can of tuna has a picture of a dolphin on it. Does it contain dolphin? No! Now, if you take the, uh, not brown, not yellow, uh, if you take the blue pill, you can go on believing that humans run the planet, but the red pill will allow you to see world for what it really is, the truth is that we are all being controlled by interdimensional... Do your own research! <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, just a little fun backstage fact for you uh, trivia buffs. This is a tuna foil hat. Um, and it is completely impossible, no matter how many times you wash it, to get the smell of tuna out of this <laughs> material. Um, you know what, let's have a show and smell. Here, just pass this around. You can, you, you just pass that around and show it. That, that might actually be worth something someday. Thank you for actually smelling it, I love that. Uh, if there's any chemists in the audience that know how to get the smell of tuna out of uh, tin foil, please let me know. <laughs> that might do it, that might do it. Okay, so speaking of getting out, um, you might be wondering how I got out. Um, how, why am I here right now instead of ranting on a podcast about reptilian UFO chemtrails? I don't need to steal <laughs> en your Enjoy hand. it. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it's it's your loss. <laughs> um, so, well, first of all, I never bought into every conspiracy theory. I mean, things like flat earth and reptilians were so silly that they made classy conspiracy theorists feel smugly superior. <laughs> Also, I never became an influencer. So I was just a spectator on all of this and I was passively consuming the videos. I wasn't even sharing them myself on social media. So while I don't personally believe there's such a thing as a point of no return, I think that some people are more deeply entrenched than others. And some people would have a much harder time. I mean, imagine what it would be like to have to stand in front of an audience and admit that you were wrong. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> What actually got me out was, ironically, the conspiracy theorist mindset itself. 
Um, because if you think about what conspiracy theorists teach, thank you for passing that all the way around. Did anybody not get a smell? That's, oh, pass it that way. So if you think about the conspiracy theorist mindset, they teach that you're being fed a narrative um, and that you cannot trust the media because the media is all just a bunch of paid shills. And that normies, that would be the non-conspiracy theorists, thank you, Kenny. Um, <laughs> you look great. Normies just believe what they're told, right? And so that's why you have to do your own research. Well, at some point, it started to dawn on me that this is a narrative. <laughs> this is a narrative. And that conspiracy theorists have their own media. They're making lots of media. And they're getting paid to do it. And I was supposed to just believe what they told me. So I started to actually do my own research. How about that? Um, and this led to a very confusing time in my life when I wasn't really sure who to trust or what to think about anything. Okay, so I've got an allegory for you here. It was like stepping out of Plato's cave. You know, Plato, the philosopher? So um, he's had this like allegory where you know people are down in the shadows and there's fire and there's chains and they're in a cave and somebody stumbles up into the light and they see the sun and they're blinded and they stumble back down and they tell the people about it and they don't believe them. And if any of that's confusing to you, good! That's how I felt. So that was the mind trivia chapter of my life, and I am very grateful to have had supportive family and friends during that time. My parents who loved me unconditionally, I have a supportive wife who was on her journey coming out of her own like new age religious rabbit hole, and so we got to do that together and explore that together, and that was great for both of us. Finally, I'd like to thank all of the good science communicators out there and editors of Wikipedia and people who are putting out good quality information, um, because that sort of anchored my epistemological compass. So I really can't take credit for doing any of this myself. And uh, this may seem cheesy, but I love inspirational quotes. So uh, I may be getting this one a little bit wrong, but uh, to paraphrase, I think it was Sir Isaac Asimov. Um. So uh, if I've seen farther than most, it's because I tried to stand on the shoulders of giants and fell off into the pit of alligators at the bottom. They really should have warned us about the alligators. I love that quote. It's heartwarming um, and, and really speaks to me. Um, and that's also from memory, so don't correct me. Um, so now here I am. I'm back out of the pit of alligators and putting my rusty theater skills to an actual useful purpose. And so, yeah, here's my channel. And in the short time that I've started this channel, I've taken on cults and con artists and grifters and Kenny Biddle and, and, <laughs> and red pills and blue pills and, of course, pseudoscience. It's sort of an outward artistic expression of my inner process of reevaluating my beliefs. Um, so, for example, I went back and learned about uh, homeopathy. I <laughs> took a little trip back in time and found out that uh, when it was invented, it was uh, the founder Friedrich Hobb. And medical science wasn't really a thing during that time. So, you know, your doctor might bleed you to death with leeches. That's my wife, uh, by the way. She's, she's wonderful. So, you know, if you're, if you're given the choice between something ineffective that could kill you versus something ineffective that did nothing, you know, the, the second alternative was actually pretty good. So uh, the homeopathy might end up being the lesser of two evils. And this all inspired me to write a poem. And uh, I'd like to share it with you now. It's the first time I've performed this poem in front of an audience. I'm not really a poet, but uh, it became sort of a centerpiece of the video. And so uh, here we go. <clears throat> I have to get into character here. Freedy longed for gentler medicine that wasn't so heinous. He had two great ideas which he pulled out of his anus. <laughs> first, that the medicine should also be the disease. He called this the law of similarities. The medicine should be the thing that made you sick. So, if you have a tummy ache, <clears throat> take some arsenic. <laughs> oh no. You might say, that's a bad solution. Well, the second idea was lots and lots of dilution. Just take one drop and with a stirring motion, mix it into some water the size of the ocean. Just stir, stir, stir until there's nothing left and the placebo effect takes care of the rest. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for entertaining that. That's very kind. Um, then, of course, after smugly writing that last line about the placebo effect takes care of the rest, I started to wonder if I actually knew what I was talking about when I used that phrase. Um, and so I 
you know, better late than never. I'd already published the video, but I did a little research and it turned out to be a whole other can of worms. And so I ended up making another video about it. And I'm not going to go into the science here in case it goes over your heads, because, you know, not all of us has taken science classes. Um, but you can watch that video and learn why uh, the pop psychology notion of the placebo effect is pretty much wrong. You know, hey, it's not bad to admit that you're wrong, even in front of an audience. It's, it's better than the alternative, right? The alternative being repeatedly proven wrong by science and just plugging your ears and ignoring it. Maybe that's the alternative in alternative medicine. <laughs> so I am open to feedback, unlike some of the uh, some of the other videos that I debunk, I've got the comments turned on. Um, and so, for example, in this early video where I suggested that the GoFast might actually be a bird, a very polite person pointed out that it actually could be a balloon um, based on the IR data. And so I thanked them for that comment and said, thanks, I'm going to update my next video and ended up going with balloon in my John Oliver video. <laughs> who knows? I mean, who knows what it is? It's too small and blurry to see. But and on this video, thank you, Faith, I've got five minutes left. Sorry, I've only got like 20 more minutes of content. Okay. Um, so on this video, I got a lot of supportive comments, but I got this one, which is an absolute gem, and I want to read it to you. I just, I love this comment. So it's by a person named The Idiot Philosopher, and it says, dude, you're way off. This video actually made me laugh. You have no idea what you're talking about. And this is beautiful in so many ways. I mean, the screen name is perfect. The spelling, the two different spellings of your and your with the same meaning, but different spellings. I only had one follow-up question. And I got not one, but two great responses to this. So the first one says, you should maybe go out from your cave, my friend. Take a deep breath and open your mind to things you might not understand. You won't get anything straight with this typical condescension. So, you know, I love being told now to go out of my cave by people who are in a cave. It's, oh, the irony. Um, and the other response I got to this was, you should research the Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> oh, the beautiful, beautiful irony <laughs> of being lectured about the Dunning-Kruger effect by someone who clearly does not understand the Dunning-Kruger effect. I, wow. And also, the screen name, again, tracks perfectly. Sometimes people's names just match up with their content. So I was just going to let that go. I mean, that's just self-contained perfection. I have nothing to add. No notes. It's, um, I, I wanted to just let this person have the last word. But I know some of you are itching on your chairs to point out the fact that, so somebody did, someone else, not me, pointed out that, as said by various science direct articles and from Psychology Today article, the Dunning-Kruger effect is mostly a statistical artifact. Raise your hand if that was your comment. So one of you. I would not call myself the sniffer fox. <laughs> Each to their own. <laughs> you know what? I don't feel as dumb now as I did at the beginning of this presentation. And maybe that's what this is all about. In fact, you know what? I feel like I could do this whole thing again from the beginning and do it better. OK, let's do that. We've got time. It, it's OK. It's all right. These people probably had lunch yesterday. They'll probably have lunch again tomorrow. It's fine. So um, let's, just, let's just rewind the whole presentation. Uh, just stop there. OK, let's rewind. Let's go. OK, here we go. There, there we go. Re rewinding. OK. <clears throat> Hi. I'm Coleman Watts, and I run the YouTube channel, Think This Through. Now, I've only ever done this kind of presentation once, and it was about 30 minutes ago. Um, so quick show of hands. Um, who here has ever believed something that turned out to not be true? OK, well, you were wrong. Suck it up. <laughs> uh, no. And, <laughs> actually, I feel like admitting that you were wrong doesn't actually make you an idiot. And you shouldn't have to feel like an idiot. Um, because fixing your errors and correcting your mistakes actually makes you a scientist. Thank you. Well Got time for a few questions? Yes. Oh, no. So you said that you came out of the rabbit hole because you realized that you were being fed a narrative. And my question is, how did you figure that out? I'm just brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> It took a long time. I don't even know. There was, it, was, it was a confusing time in my life, and I don't even think I've, look, I've made enough sense of it to make this presentation, and that's about as far as I've gotten. It's such a difficult thing to do, and I'm fascinated by why people change their minds. Mm -hmm. I tell uh, you what, if you want to have a conversation on my YouTube channel. Great. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Okay. I love it. Yeah, wow. that, that's my channel, by the way. Anybody wants Hi, to? Hi, thank you. Know. you. Yeah. 
Really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. What about social costs of changing sort of from one perspective to another? Because that's something I found occurring quite often with people. You know, you're part of this tribe, and if you start questioning, there can be real social costs associated with it. Did you experience that? Absolutely. In fact, there was a whole part of my presentation that I cut um, because for time, because I didn't want to, you know, go over time. But it's fine, apparently. We, so we can go over time. You know, I, because after I started to work my way up out of the rabbit hole, and as I was in that process, and after that process, maybe I'm still in that process. I started to have uh, friendly or not so friendly conversations with other people who had shared my views, and uh, it was fascinating to see their responses to things. Because I would ask them, you know, what's your evidence for this, and they would talk to me about. Um, they would basically just feed me a big narrative or point out a bunch of like little things that were weird. If I started to ask more questions or express more doubts, they would pull out these pop psychology terms or like half understood logical fallacies. And it was like, wow, they, like they turn everything around on its head. I actually learned about logical fallacies from being in the conspiracy theorist world because they, they latch onto that stuff and the pop psychology stuff like Dunning-Kruger effect. So, I don't think I've answered your question at all, but I think. <laughs> <laughs> you lose friends. I mean. uh, there's one person who definitely won't talk to me anymore. I've gotten kicked out of Facebook groups, groups that, that were explicitly like, we do not allow criticism of these cool. ideas. Yeah, that was. I want to suggest, I, I, I don't know if you're from this area or not, but I want to suggest some place you, to go that you would really enjoy. It's the Cryptozoology and Paranormal Museum in Littleton, you know, North Carolina. I'll have to check it out. We're talking Bigfoot, ghosts, wow. UFOs, the whole nine yards. Well, Kenny's the field trip leader. He should be taking us there. And here's the funny part. The guy that runs it is a former employee of the New York Post. If you're from New York, you would know how ironic and funny that is. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. New York Post is the one that's doing all the exposés about Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. They, uh, they, uh, they would do headlines in, back in the day of headless woman in topless bar. That kind of stuff. <laughs> That's that great. Tracks. I like that line. We have one more question. Okay. So maybe you have Eric. Oh, but, yeah, maybe we, we need to talk afterwards. Um, your comment about the placebo effect, can you summarize? Are you a, do you think it's not real, or are you talking about what caused it, or what? Well, when researchers are doing medical trials, they talk about placebo effects, which is anything that can happen to the placebo group in the trial. So um, if it's an allergy medicine that's being tested, um, the trial could happen between seasons, and the seasonal change could affect the people in the placebo group, for example. So that's one of the placebo effects. But it has nothing to do with people's psychology or taking the fake pill. Right. Oh. Okay. Agreed. <laughs> Okay. Well, there is an actual Douglas Adams quote that made me, well, your thing, and it's a learning experience is one of those things that you say, you know that thing you just did? Don't do that. 